Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. We're very excited to dive into a really important topic, um, one that I'm sure you're very interested in, and that is how we can engage youth um, in our design of transportation projects and our installation of quick build um, and temporary deployments of, of uh, safety project strategies. So we're going to hear a lot today about how to really get youth engaged in this process so that they're sort of at the table helping direct these projects and really um, have a, a, a meaningful role in them. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists uh, shortly, and then we'll have a bit of housekeeping information to share with you before we really get started. Um, so let me go ahead and I'll let you know who you're going to be hearing from today. First, I'm Dan Jeline with the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, um, and I'll be helping to moderate and host the webinar today. Uh, we're joined by Lauren Marchetti, uh, who is a Senior Strategic Advisor at HSRC, the Highway Safety Research Center. Lauren has served um, as the first director of the National Center for Safe Routes to School um, and associate director of the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center. Um, a project that she led for the PBIC launched National Walk to School Day in 1997, and Lauren is continuing her work to advance safe walking and bicycling with a focus on youth and the trip to school. So welcome, Lauren. Glad to have you here. Um, we're also joined by Melody Gibson, who is the education director at the Civic Design Center, uh, where she developed the youth education pro the youth, youth education programs Design Your Neighborhood and the Nashville Youth Design Team. Uh, we'll hopefully be joined soon by Sydney Thompson, uh, who is a third year Nashville Youth Design Team member heading into her senior year of high school. Uh, in addition to the NYDT, Sydney has been an intern at the Civic Design Center for the past year through a program at her school. And she has a strong passion for youth advocacy and making a difference in her communities. And her, her goal is to help make Nashville a safer and more youth friendly city. Um, finally, we're joined by Renee Espio, who is the Complete Streets Administrator for the City and County of Honolulu, where she oversees efforts to make our streets safer for all roadway users. And she previously helped to establish and manage the city's transit-oriented development program within the Department of Planning and Permitting. Uh, so we're delighted to have these panelists here with us today. Uh, we're going to get into their presentations very soon. I want to, before we do that, just <clears throat> uh, ground us a little bit and get some uh, housekeeping information out there for you. Um, attendees, you won't be able to speak during the webinar today because we have so many of you here, but you do have the ability to ask your questions. Um, and we hope that you'll do that throughout the webinar. Uh, we have held about 25 or 30 minutes at the end of the presentations just to answer those questions and get some discussion going with our panelists. So uh, submit your questions and comments at any time using the questions pane, and we'll get to those as soon as we can. Um, we are archiving today's webinar. The slides are already posted online. I'll send you a link to where you can find those momentarily. Um, we also have a recording that we'll be preparing and putting up online too. So I'll send you the link to those materials um, in a follow-up email later on. So you have that uh, in case you wanna refer back to it. Um, the email will also contain instructions for generating a certificate of attendance in case you wanna report your uh, PDHs or CM credits and other professional development hours. Again, a follow-up email later will get you the information that you need, so don't feel that you need to jot all this down right now. It will be coming to you later. We hope you'll be able to relax and enjoy our, our presentations. Um, finally, I just encourage you to uh, review the other episodes and webinars that we put on. They're all archived online, and keep an eye out for some of the sessions that we have coming up in the next few months. Um, with that, I'd like to turn things over now to Lauren Marchetti, um, who uh, will help kind of center us today, uh, introduce the topic, and uh, get us going with the presentation. So, Lauren, um, whenever you're ready. Okay, I think I, I think I can be heard now. Yes. Uh, uh, first, I would like to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be able to talk about a topic I care so much about, uh, youth and walking and biking. Um, and what we've done has been housed in Vision Zero for Youth. It's an initiative we started in 2016 in partnership with the FIA Foundation. And our two main premises are that children deserve safe places to walk and bike, starting with the trip to school. And that by starting with children and the trip to school, communities can become safer places for everyone. And this in particular holds true for initiatives for trying to get uh, speeding calmed down neighborhoods looking more friendly for walking, biking. There is much more ready willingness if you're starting with youth, and then perhaps that can lead to more places. 
The last couple of years, we've been doing a lot of work around youth advocacy, how to build a bridge between youth and city leaders. And actually, it's happening all over the country already. We just needed to identify it and see what makes it work. So we did give technical assistance to two youth-led groups uh, to see what their barriers were, what their interests were, and what were tools that might be helpful. And then we did a case study that looked at 14 youth-led groups across the country, and there were interviews with both youth and with leaders. And all this culminated in what we're releasing today, which is a guide and recommendations for engaging youth to advance safer streets for all. The two photos on the right have great meaning. These are actually the two, two global youth road safety advocates that did much of the work that we're talking about. They did the, the interviews for the case study and much of the authorship of the guide and the recommendations is their work. And they also represent typical reasons why youth get involved. Jacob Smith uh, was in a very serious car crash uh, and he had a long rehabilitation and he wanted to be part of the solution so that other young people wouldn't go with, through what he did. He currently is the uh, executive director for noise and he's also a UN road safety uh, advocate and here he is speaking at a UN meeting. Now, Allison, I've got a much younger photo of her because I wanted to highlight the work that she actually did in high school. She too was greatly affected by a friend who was killed in a crosswalk. Uh, and she started the Vision Youth, Vision Zero Youth Council. And at that time, New York City was trying to get lower speed limits in school zones and speed cameras. And the work of the youth combined with the, North, the New York City DOT really gave a lot of the community support that was needed for such a bold venture. So the two documents that we're releasing today one is a guide and has got more of the research and the findings and, and how we came to the conclusions we did. It's the engaging youth to advance safer streets for all. The other is recommendations for meaningful engagement. And the recommendations start with setting the stage and go all the way to recommendations for sustainability. And again, this is based on all the information we've been gathering the last two years. But what's real important to me right now is the photo on the left is Hawaii. And Renee will be telling you a lot about that program soon. And the photo on the right is Nashville and the Civic Design Center, uh, which Melody and Sydney are gonna be talking about soon. And we are so grateful for their cooperation and their being here today because they're the ones that are getting it done locally and local is what matters. Last thing I wanted to tell you about the guide was we found meaningful youth engagement had so many different looks and so many ways of engaging. The San Francisco Youth Transportation Advisory Board, they were established by the city to give advice as to what the youth perspective would be uh, to the Department of Transportation. But other places were helping collect street and community assessment data, developing street designs, constructing quick build projects. The other uh, photo is the Atlanta students advocating for pedestrians. Uh, they were very excited about working with the city of Atlanta to understand where they could put pop-up demonstration projects or quick build projects. But they are also the ones that were advocating for reduced transit fares for students. Another group is bringing youth around the country together to advocate for bicycling. And generally, most of these organizations are providing community support for slowing traffic, especially around schools. I wanted to end with a plug for walk, walk and Roll to School Day this October 4th and Bike and Roll to School Day May 8th. And the plug I wanted to make was I noticed in Orlando, Florida in 2022, they said they were using Bike and Roll to School Day to test out a bike lane uh, a pop-up bike line, and this one-day project would inform a guide that the city was doing. And sure enough, one year later, uh, in May, they were announcing that the guide was completed and they were giving credit to the walk and roll to school day as being a great impetus for getting it done. So with that, I would love to turn it over to our fabulous speakers today, and thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks very much, Lauren. That's great um, to kick off. And I'm going to share a link shortly to where folks can find those new reports and guides um, um, online. But let's go ahead and continue on with our presentations. Um, I'm going to hand things over to uh, Melody Gibson and Sydney Thompson to share their story from Nashville. Um, please continue to send in your questions. We've already got a few really good ones um, and comments along the way, and we will uh, we'll go from there. So, um, Melody, go ahead and share your screen whenever you are ready. Don't forget the video uh, audio docs too. Yeah. All right, I think I got it. Great, it was great. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Um, as he mentioned, I'm the, the education director at the Civic Design Center. Um, so we're a pretty small nonprofit based in Nashville. Um, whose mission is to advocate for civic design visions and actionable change in communities to improve quality of life for all. Um, so we have two youth programs um, that we have at the Civic Design Center, which is what I'll speak to, Sydney being one of the members of one of the programs. Um, but I just wanted to start by how um, kind of the mindset that we go into our youth work with is, um, is that Oftentimes adults think, you know, we we're training our leaders for tomorrow, like when we work with youth. So we're trying to provide them great leadership experience and education because um, down the road we're, you know, we're going to need them to be good leaders, which is really great and very true. Um, however, we try to frame it as we're treating the young people as having something to contribute today, right now. Um, and so we believe that their lived experiences um, are are valuable to our, you know, transit planning processes. And it's, they add a, a perspective and a creativity that um, adults just can't have. And so that, that is how we approach our work with youth. Um, so we directly teach knowledge of built what we call built environment design. So that's transportation, but it's also looking at the whole kind of ecosystem of a city or a town or a, um, a neighborhood. And then um, awareness of how the built environment impacts community issues and then civic action strategies for change. This is a short breakdown of our two programs. The first is called Design Your Neighborhood. And it's a middle school STEAM curriculum that is designed to reach, kind of reach the masses. It reaches thousands of students each year in Nashville and recently Chattanooga. And then the Nashville Youth Design Team. Um, that program recruits from the eighth grade middle school classes um, and it provides a year round internship that Sydney will tell you more about. I'm going to start us off by going into a little bit of one of the transportation projects for Design Your Neighborhood. A little bit more information about how the projects work. So there are three week, week long, what we call project-based learning curriculum or sets of curriculum. Um, and they are written to be seamlessly embedded into these five courses. So they meet state learning standards for uh, for these five courses. And then all of them have some sort of direct community impact at the end, some type of civic action that the students do to advocate for their community. Um, and then we also make sure that in that process, they're exposed to design and civically oriented careers um, through volunteers coming in and either speaking or, um, or giving them feedback on projects. I'll feature one of the projects, we call it the Sustainable Transportation Paint Challenge. And this project fits the requirements for um, science and STEAM courses here in Nashville or in Tennessee. And I'll show a video so y'all can see what that project is like. My name is Brianna Grant. I am a permanent substitute teacher here at Antioch Middle School. We've been working with the Civic Design Center for about three weeks. This project is a transportation project just to make it safer for students and parents, anybody in the school area. Our first idea for helping our school and our community 
was making a crosswalk as our crosswalks near our school are fading away and aren't as reliable as they used to be. Just to make our environment a safer place to walk and have fun and just be safer in general. That's why we created this this crosswalk. It's nice, bright, so people can see it. Make sure it's well known that this is a crosswalk. And then the stop sign, to so let them know they gotta slow down. Most of the time, people are on their phones while driving, so you have to put bright colors and stuff to make people more aware of their surroundings. It's really important because it's for the sake of other kids in the school. The Civic Design Center has offered our kids a artistic outlet. They came in and gave me all the lesson plans and worked with the kids. They learned some new terminology. I learned some too. They got all their creative juices flowing. So it's been amazing working with the Civic Design Center. Okay, yeah, these are just a few pictures of what that, that project look like, looks like in classes. Um, we bring in design professionals to collaborate with the students on their designs, which, um, you know, is great collaborative career exposure. Um, and then the paint days are a lot of fun. And we have um, volunteers from the community come out and help with those paint days. There's one of the finished product at Antioch Middle School. So just to put a little bit of student voice in this, we um, have a, a research team that does pre and post surveys and focus group interviews with the students before and after the project. So I'll, um, I'll leave you guys to read this quote before we dive into the next part. So this is pretty typical of just hearing the excitement and empowerment coming from the young people after they've had a chance to contribute something tangible to their community. Um, just really feeling like, hey, I've, you know, I've got something to say and I really want people to listen to me. So I'll pass it off to Sydney to tell you guys about the youth design team. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you all can hear me. Uh, my name is Sydney and I'm a part of the NYDT. The NYDT is a diverse group of high school interns who work year round to make Nashville's neighborhoods more supportive of youth well being. And so, in order to get things started, we use an action research process to understand youth wellness in Nashville, and that's how we come up our, with our projects. And so first we need to understand how local built environment factors impact youth wellness. Then we need to engage in community-based research to understand the current state of the built environment. Then we implement our designs, interventions to address the built environment challenges. And then we advocate for long-term sustainable change. And so one of our projects focused on making Nashville streets safer Oh, I'm sorry, this was one of our projects that we um, used on making our streets safer for teens and youth to walk. So first we started by looking at the data from our youth wellness map that we created from surveys and we gave them to other youth in Nashville. The first thing we saw um, were just that youth want a lot more places to walk and there was a big desire of places of um, things for youth to walk with, sorry. We looked at the data from the city's zero vision report and learned that the pedestrians rate, the pedestrians were being killed at a high rate and especially on Dickerson Pike. We then chose the deadliest intersection on Dickerson Pike and designed a short-term short crosswalk with the colorful 
bulb out to create a more spacious um, space for pedestrians and catch the eye of drivers. And the we meant we meant to do this so that we could um, help the drivers be more cautious and more safer when driving around because they drove really fast around there. And our design needed to stay within um, the two thousand dollar budget material that we had, and it needed to be installed by the NYDT over the weekend. Our design also had to be improved by Tennessee Department of Transportation, which is TDOT. And it was the very first technical urbanism project that they ever improved, which was actually a really big, big accomplishment by us. And on a weekend in October, we got out and we painted the insulation. We measured the speed of cars before and after the insulation and found out that they slowed down as they went around the curve. Many community members talked about our project on social media and around the neighborhood, which gave us a lot of attention. But we couldn't stop there. We needed to research to actually understand if the design actually helped. So then we led community walks before and after the installation to learn how the design impacted pedestrians. We then took interviews with local news so we could um, help more people understand about our design work. About a year later, uh, TDOT announced a $30 million complete street project that they were going to build on Dickerson Pike, including what we did um, with our installation. They credited our community advocacy that was done, which was, like I said, a great, great day for us. In addition to being an NYDT intern, I also do an internship at the Civic Design Center with my school, which is Nashville Big Picture High School. So a problem that I noticed um, was that there was a lack of shelter and um, around and at the bus stop where I wait at and my other peers. And so there were 30 plus of us waiting at least 30 to 40 minutes for the bus. And sometimes it could be in extreme uncomfortable climate situations. And yeah. I then brought the issue to um, the Nashville Public Transit System, we go. They had informed me that they were already aware that the intersection needed a bus shelter and would go ahead and start the process of installing a shelter. They gave me different options and types of shelters and I chose the one that's on the left, um, the one that I feel like would fit the area since so many people would wait there. And on the right is a picture of the intersection. Then I wanted to figure out how I could make this shelter authentic to my school and the community. So I came up with the idea of adding paint artwork on and around the shelter after it was installed. And these were a few of the ideas I had in mind. And so on May 13th, I went to the bus stop and collected feedback from the community about what they wanted to see. I also gave the survey to my students, to my peers at school, I'm sorry. And throughout the survey, many of my peers um, wanted to add artwork and flowers to make the area more lively and colorful. And so after I received a yes from WeGo to implement the bus shelter, I then applied for a grant with Greater Natural Realtors to fund the paint day. They gave me the grant offered to volunteer on the paint day as well. As for my senior capstone project, I will organize a group of community members from my school and volunteers from GNR to paint artwork um, on and around the bus shelter. Thank you. Okay, I'll end, thank you, Sydney. Um, I'll end our presentation on um, just five things that we've found have really created um, opportunities for us to sustain engagement with young people because there's a lot of barriers and challenges when working with young people um, that, you know, just don't operate the same as adults in the world. They have to go to school and have activities. And so um, these are just some what we've adopted as best practices to do this type of work that I wanted to share. Oops, wrong way. 
The first is that we give the young people diverse opportunities for engagement. So we um, have options for them to choose tasks and to choose project types that um, cover a range of, of skills and interests. And um, so we have art and design options, organizing and activism, and then research and mapping. And we found that, you know, sometimes they'll come in interested in design and then they end up really getting into the advocacy part or vice versa. And so they really um, learn and grow and kind of fulfill their interests throughout the program. Um, the second is that we really try to make it relationally focused. Um, this is a quote from one of our members, but we really try to foster relationships with the adults and the students and then provide plenty of um, plenty, of, plenty of fun, engaging activities during the, the internship for them to get to know each other as well. Um, and what we feel like, um, oh, not yet. Okay, third is intentional reflection. So making sure we're always reflecting on um, the purpose of the work for them and you know why they're doing it and what it means to them and their community. Um, and this is the piece that we really feel also strengthens the relationship, especially between us as the adults and the young people is build trust is that um, we, you know, kind of set up the internship as them leading the decision making for their projects. Um, we provide opportunities for team leadership. Anytime we get invited to do community speaking such as this, we we take that opportunity um, and then locally attend community based meetings when they're relevant to, to what we're doing. Um, and then uh, one more note about this, but um, but yeah, I think the key here is that um, is that we hope that the young people feel like they're, um, you know, they're valued. And yes, it's a learning and leadership experience, but it's also them making an important contribution to their community. And then last is compensation. So we pay an hourly rate to all of the youth design team interns, um, and we follow the same pay rate rate as our city's youth employment program. Um, and so this is a you know priority up front that we tell our funders and put in grant applications that um, you know we have to put a certain amount of of the funds towards making sure that they're compensated and paid for um, for sharing their experiences. Okay, thank you. I'll pass it off. Um, this is our Instagram or the Youth Design Team's Instagram and email if you're interested in contacting us. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Sydney, for uh, sharing that work. We'll um, we'll circle back during the Q and A because there are a lot of really great questions that came in. Um, but for now, let's turn things to um, to Renee in Honolulu uh, for um, a little story about what's happening out there, and then we'll um, we'll come back for a discussion. Was good. You're still muted, by the way, Renee. Okay, here we go. <laughs> pushing all the buttons here. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really honored to be able to join this group today to talk about this really uh, fun project. Um, my name is Renee Espio. I'm the Complete Streets Administrator for City and County of Honolulu. Um, I spend most of my time coordinating the Complete Streets efforts of our city government. Uh, but every once in a while, um, we get to participate in some fun projects like the two that I'm going to present. Um, and while today I'm uh, the spokesperson for these projects, uh, I just wanted to state that I do represent a pretty broad coalition of local groups that came together to make these projects happen. Um, and so I know some of them are probably listening in today, and I just want to thank them again um, for all of their uh, contribution and support. Um, I, I, you know, I know the title of the event uh, includes quick build in there, so I assume most people kind of know what that is. Um, but, you know, people kind of ask what we consider quick build here in Honolulu. Um, for us, it's really um, projects that involve simple construction methods. So signing, striping, um, and modular materials like curbing and delineator posts. Uh, we tend to do most of these projects as sort of semi-permanent, um, not necessarily, you know, kind of short term. We try to keep them out there as long as possible until we can come in and replace them um, with something um, more permanent. Um, but this is a way for us to basically get safety improvements and placemaking out on the streets faster because um, they don't typically uh, trigger any permitting requirements for us. 
Let's see here. Okay, um, so the first project that I'm going to present today uh, was City and County's first pilot project using mural art um, to, uh, in collaboration with sort of quick build pedestrian safety strategies. Um, we did lead the process uh, with significant financial support from our State Department of Health, um, which allowed us to engage street plans. Some of you may have um, encountered street plans over the years. Uh, Mike Leiden and Tony Garcia there run the uh, consulting firm that help um, communities kind of learn how to do this process. Um, and so that was how we kind of jumped into this game with, with some uh, professional guidance and assistance. Um, and then we engaged Farrington High School uh, we actually had a previous relationship with their engineering academy um, because we had been doing TOD planning in that neighborhood for nearly a decade um, prior to the project. Um, so we approached the teachers and asked if they were interested in doing a, um, you know, kind of multi-month uh, project during the school year on street design and quick build projects. And they had just finished up designing some structures for the World Surf League, and we're looking for some new projects. And so they got really excited about this one as well. Um, so the Kalihi neighborhood is a, it's a dense uh, mixed use community. Um, it is a low income community. It's sort of a interesting jumble of industrial uses, commercial uses, residential. Um, it has historically been an entry community for new waves of immigration. Um, the demographics uh, tend to evolve and change as immigration patterns evolve. Um, there is a middle school and an elementary school very nearby, all Title I schools. Um, the project actually was on a very busy street. You can see here we uh, went straight to kind of the the heart of some of our safety needs. Uh, North King Street is a principal urban arterial um, with a lot of cars traveling it on it every day. Um, certainly made the project a bit challenging in terms of traffic control, um, as well as kind of the long-term viability of any uh, quick build project out there just in terms of um, durability. And the funding for the project um, was actually uh, SNAP Ed funds. Um, so that's uh, to support communities, um, needing better access to um, local and healthy foods. Um, and so this community kind of hit all the boxes for us. Um, so to start the process, uh, we did several class presentations on complete streets and then held a workshop uh, where academy students mapped their daily routes through the community, um, identifying barriers to walking and rolling and biking. Uh, they, you know, being transportation professionals, we assumed it would all be about, you know, cars are going too fast here, they're not stopping for us. Uh, but of course, kids have a different perspective um, than we do. You know, they identified uh, issues as diverse as kind of unsavory characters, you know, who are always in a certain park, um, or, you know, they would change their route depending on where certain food trucks would park. Um, and, you know, dealing with bike theft, of course, kind of influence their daily commute. Uh, so it's really valuable for us to understand all those nuances. Um, and then the students identified specific streets that they thought should be improved. And it was no surprise that North King Street was identified um, since it's a high pedestrian injury corridor um, and immediately fronts the high school. So our project team narrowed down the feasible locations and the students voted for two signalized crossings of North King Street, uh, both being very near bus stops, uh, public housing, and a busy commercial area. Uh, so after picking the locations, uh, we then went out on site with the students so they could observe the issues and suggest solutions themselves. Um, you know, I just want to note here the student you can see in the wheelchair here, he had a particularly uh, unique and challenging experience navigating his neighborhood and honestly kind of brought a lot of us uh, to tears sharing his experience. And we are working to get some new sidewalks built on those routes. Uh, that uh, student's voice is probably never going to get out of my head. <laughs> um, and then we held another workshop really on the layout and the design for the two chosen intersections with street plans uh, and all of our local partners. Uh, you can maybe see here the kids have their um, guide to tactical urbanism here. We gave each of them a copy um, and we just uh, had a lot of fun kind of exploring uh, new, new ways of thinking and new strategies for these guys. 
Um, during the workshops, you know, we suggest they consider both safety treatments um, as well as patterns and murals appropriate for their school and the Kalihi community. Uh, the photo on the left here shows a historic facade on the high school itself. Uh, for example, the middle, this G is their logo for governors. Um, and so you saw a lot of the art that they came up with didn't include that. Um, we also introduced traffic engineering concepts and guidelines, such as the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, um, which, you know, tends to call for repeating abstract patterns, you know, tells you not to use uh, specific, you know, words and try to um, avoid using yellow and white because those are traffic control um, uh, colors and, you know, kind of steer towards earth tones. So it was a uh, fun to see kind of how they incorporated all these different guidelines into what they came up with. Um, it, being an engineering academy, it was mostly boys um, or young men, to be honest. Um, so it was really fun and a little bit competitive um, on the day where they actually were drawing everything up. Uh, but the activity really also allowed for um, some beauty and creativity and um, it was uh, really um, a memorable event, and as you can see, uh, really photogenic as well. Um, so the project team selected the most feasible pattern the students came up with in the layout, um, and then this is the final plan. These are two plans kind of laid on top of each other. Um, uh, we <clears throat> um, circled in on doing curb extensions um, instead of uh, too much on the decorative crosswalk. Um, approach uh, for a number of reasons. Obviously, curb extensions have a lot of safety benefits. They shorten the pedestrian crossings. They slow turning vehicles, uh, but they're also just a bit simpler to install, right? You don't have to uh, close down lanes um, to paint over the crosswalk. And then in theory, uh, you should be able to protect the art a little better because vehicles won't be driving over it. Um, a unifying mural uh, would tie together the two locations. And our council member's office then helped us uh, get out in the community and notify uh, area businesses and other uh, community organizations about the project. And then once the pattern was approved by our Commission on Culture and Arts, uh, we were able to start planning installation day for late 2019. Uh, so installation at both sites took about three full days uh, with a lot of volunteer hands. We had a sign up sheet. Um, so people, you know, affiliated with the school or with the city could sign up, uh, but a lot of our partner organizations as well. As well. Um, the students helped most directly uh, with the curb extensions that are directly across the street from the high school. Um, so that's the picture here on the left that was uh, highlighted on the cover of that new uh, publication. So you can see the, the school is kind of behind these trees here behind the bus stop. Um, and this is uh, immediately uh, fronting the school. Um, of course, it rained on installation day, uh, particularly when we had the students out there. Uh, and it rained pretty hard, um, but the rain did pass and the road did dry um, and the murals ultimately did come to life. Um, so the paint had barely dried on these curb extensions um, before school let out. And we were immediately reminded why we were there, uh, you know, kind of getting sunburned and sweaty and paint all over us uh, for the multiple days, um, really just making the whole experience immediately worth it. Um, the commercial location that we did uh, kind of beyond here uh, was pretty immediately impacted actually by the bus stops on the periphery of the project. Very important lesson learned. Uh, be very aware of your bus stop locations and the pattern of your buses trying to get to the curb. Um, but we have been able to maintain uh, this installation fronting the high school. And we are very excited uh, that we are also in uh, final design now to put uh, partially protected bike lanes along the full corridor, um, which will actually take the place of this curb extension. So we're gonna make sure it looks good until then, uh, but really happy we have a whole corridor wide safety upgrade project in the works. 
Okay, the second project I wanted to highlight today um, was actually run primarily by Blue Zones Project, uh, which was very active in the islands a few years ago. Uh, Colby Taketa was the uh, project manager and really um, just put a lot of a love and effort into this project. Um, so Blue Zones had um, connected up with the Robert Louis Stevenson Middle School leadership class. So this was a um, kind of a, I don't know, kind of a go-getter, uh, high achieving group of kids um, who somehow came very interested in traffic safety, uh, probably based on their personal experience. Um, so what they really wanted to do was um, dig into this issue of transportation and safety around their school in depth. Um, and then they ended up spearheading kind of all aspects of the resulting quick build project. Um, so the Makiki neighborhood is um, just on the mountainside of our urban core in downtown, a uh, still pretty dense area. Um, it is a slightly higher income community than Kalihi, uh, but these are still all Title I schools. There's also an elementary school immediately uh, behind the middle school and then a high school about a block away. So lots of students uh, walking through the neighborhood. Um, the project was made possible by three grants that were all uh, pursued by the leadership class students. Um, one was from Blue Zones Project. The second was from Ulupono Initiative, a local funder here who supports innovation and transportation. And then the city also provided a Safe Routes to School mini grant of about $3,500. Um, and altogether, uh, those costs paid for primarily um, for installation and the artist uh, for the project. Uh, we did do this on a two lane street, uh, fortunately. So it was a little simpler than North King Street. Um, but the safety uh, uh, needs were, were still pretty significant. So this project took a bit of a more traditional kind of safe routes to school trajectory, right? It was a middle school. Um, they, uh, the students conducted a survey of parents, right? On kind of attitudes and barriers to transportation. Um, but then they hosted kind of a whole series of visiting speakers in their class. Uh, I was one of them. Uh, at least once they had, you know, Honolulu Police Department, um, other folks kind of within our industry locally. And then one of their most important connections they made was um, they had some traffic and civil engineers from a local firm, Austin Tsutsumi and Associates, uh, who actually provided pro bono services on the project um, and really taught them a lot about how to uh, progress a transportation project. Uh, the students did data collection, you know, they were out there with their speed guns, um, trying to see how fast the cars were going. Uh, they looked at crash history. Um, on one of our public websites. Um, and the resulting Safe Routes to School plan also included program recommendations uh, for the school and the parents, not just the Quick Build project. So with all this knowledge, uh, the students started to devise an action plan, um, really focusing on circulation issues, both on campus and on the city's adjacent streets. Um, as part of this process, they met with area elected officials, uh, both the council member as well as some of our state uh, electeds. And this is kind of one of my favorite pictures here. Uh, they actually presented to our neighborhood board um, and really uh, put themselves out there as sort of the project sponsor, which they were, right? They kind of had come up with this the whole time um, and really were the public spokespeople um, for the effort. Um, so I don't expect everybody to kind of read all the uh, little notes here, but you can kind of see how um, the students were basically trying to identify the issues uh, geographically um, and then start to explore what the solutions would be. Um, they also worked with the local artist on developing two art options um, for the mural pattern. Uh, what they ultimately selected was a pattern um, that included a flowering tree, uh, the plumeria tree, uh, which is commonly found in a lot of the historic cemeteries in the neighborhood, kind of a nod to the community's roots. And this is the artist here, Luke.
Um, so the rendering on the left uh, shows the final selected mural uh, that was ultimately approved by our Commission on Culture and Arts. And then on the right shows the uh, signing and striping plan, as well as the delineator uh, installation plan um, that the engineering firm came up with. Um, the striping would ultimately be installed by a hired local company, GP Roadways. They do a lot of striping projects for us in the city. That's where a lot of the project budget went to. Um, and the students and the volunteers would paint the mural um, under uh, direction from the artist. And all final approvals were set and install day was scheduled for May 2021, just before the end of the school year. We were like trying to rush before the kids got off to school uh, off for summer. Uh, installation day opened with a beautiful blessing ceremony uh, attended by the students and community leaders, school leaders, um, was really a, uh, a wonderful event kind of culminating their year and a half of study. Um, and the day ended really with uh, an epic mural um, that I'll show you pictures of in a second. Um, and one of the most uh, rewarding parts of the day, actually, this is GP Roadways here. This is kind of our our road crew guys that we had hired once they figured out what this project was and uh, kind of who was behind it. I mean, they went above and beyond. They uh, did all the crosswalks like everywhere near here that weren't even on the plan. Um, and they really got excited and kind of jumped on board with the project as well. Okay, so this is the before condition on Prospect Street. Um, this is the school driveway um, over here on the left. Um, it, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but the road does have a downhill grade here. Um, so cars are going uh, much faster than they probably would be if it was a flat grade. Um, in their you know, data collection efforts, the students found, found both um, excessive vehicle speeds here, as well as poor driver yielding to pedestrians waiting to cross. <clears throat> Um, so this is the real after condition. It kind of looks like a rendering, uh, but, but this is real. Uh, this is um, what uh, GP put in. They did all new striping. They put in the in-road signs and the delineators. And then the mural, this doesn't quite do it justice, um, but they're quite large and quite beautiful um, and just really created a great sense of place. Um, again, we went with the curb extension strategy to shorten the crossing distance. Um, tighten uh, the turns kind of in and out of the driveway and the side street on the right here um, and really just create a, a nice sense of place and provide that space for the artwork. Um, and then the in-road signs um, on the center line um, have proven to also be very effective for traffic calming. Um, so we're more than two years into this project now. Uh, we've got some weeds coming through the cracks um, in the murals uh, on the pavement, uh, but the safety performance of the installation does persist. Um, cars are going slower, uh, drivers are looking out for kids, and overall driver compliance is better around the school. It was pretty chaotic before this, uh, particular during drop off and pick up times. Um, I just really love the statement um, that the leadership class made with this project. You know, they said, you know, we don't drive. Uh, but we still matter. And this is our community and we are committed to making it better. And those students are not in this school anymore. They moved up to the high school around the corner, but I'm sure they have a great sense of pride from this project. Um, so before I wrap up, I just wanna share a few lessons learned uh, from these and some of our other projects as well. Uh, the first we've talked about today um, already, but engaging youth kind of early and in all stages of project development. Um, I certainly think that involving them um, in coming up with the concepts and selecting the locations is part of the reason these projects were so successful, right? We didn't just invite them out to paint on that day. Uh, we really did um, try to understand what their safety concerns were. Um, and try to address it directly with the project. Our Department of Health has done a study of a lot of the quick build projects around the state. And one of the recommendations that they identified as well was continuing this engagement through evaluation. Obviously, this is challenging when you have students who are no longer you know, in the class or no longer in the school, uh, but that's something that you know, we're personally trying to uh, do better 
um, and something that we've identified locally um, as an area for improvement. Um, secondly, reclaim excess space. Um, there are so many unused areas on our streets, um, whether it is areas that are, if you're lucky, kind of hatched out, you know, as kind of extra space that isn't needed for driving. Uh, those are always the simplest projects because the lines are already dr uh, drawn for you. Uh, but where there's parking lanes, for example, curb extensions are pretty much almost always feasible. Um, and, it, it, you know, beneficial to go out and observe the street um, and see where those kind of uh, excess spaces are, because I'm pretty sure they're, they're out on every street. Um, but also being mindful, right, of buses and turning vehicles. Like I said, we did have some installations very close to some of our bus stops and they just didn't make it. Um, and, you know, if you don't have an engineer on your team, uh, see if you can find one uh, who you can make friends with and really help you with thinking about some of those uh, turning radius um, and, you know, ways to kind of reduce wear and tear on the installation. Uh, number three, protect your art. Uh, we have really found curb extensions to be the sweet spot for our installations. Um, because you can protect the art. Um, if you do not put up delineators, we have seen at least here in Honolulu, cars will drive over it. Um, and unless you've used a extremely permanent material, uh, it will wear your art uh, and it will, I don't know, break your heart a little bit. Um, so that, that's really an important one for us, particularly for volunteer installed projects. Uh, number four, plan for maintenance. Uh, these projects do require a lot of maintenance, whether it's weeding, uh, delineator replacement, paint touch up. Um, but so many volunteers kind of show up for these projects and they're more than willing to come out again. Um, so continue to kind of engage those community partners that were made through the project. Um, materials do matter. Um, you know, this is not really a technical webinar per se, uh, but I will say there is sort of an inverse relationship, particularly with paint, uh, between um, ease of installation and durability. Um, and so we've experimented with a couple different products ourselves and uh, have pretty good experience with things like marine paint. Uh, we actually used tennis court paint for the Stevenson installation and found both of them to be, you know, easy enough to install. Uh, but a little more durable than your regular traffic paint. Um, and then the other thing is make sure uh, any painted surface has a non-skid material um, either in it or added to it, uh, just in case it does rain here a lot. And then finally, you know, make it permanent. Um, it doesn't have to be the exact same version of what's out there. Uh, like on North King Street, right? We're working on bike lanes through the corridor, uh, but know that um, the community is going to be really excited about those safety improvements um, and those semi-permanent installations are not going to last forever. Um, so making sure you're kind of following up with something um, more lasting uh, and more durable in the coming years. Um, and then finally, uh, based on our projects earlier this year, uh, we, we actually put together a guidebook on the process for community-led projects like these. Um, it is a living document. We continue to adjust it as we learn and experiment, um, but this is up on our website under community resources. If people want to uh, gratuitously steal from it, feel free. Um, and we also now have a youth commission as well at the City and County of Honolulu that advises um, our mayor on all kinds of issues, not just transportation, uh, but that's a new exciting partner uh, that we're working to engage as well. Um, and this is our website and uh, our Instagram handle. We're also on Facebook if you like that. Um, but encourage people to uh, check out what we've got online. Thank you so much, Renee, uh, for that awesome presentation. I love both of those projects. Um, as an aside, I just I think it's so refreshing to see before and after pictures of projects that aren't from Google Street View uh, to even to think to take the picture. Um, is so nice um, to see the real, you know, the real nice um, flashy pictures. So thank you for doing that. Um, and to Melody and her team as well. Um, let's get some discussion going because we got a lot of questions and I'm going to see how many we can answer if we can bring our whole panel back here. Um, one of the ones that we got right at the beginning uh, and it came in a couple of different times is big picture, really, how do these relationships begin uh, with youth um, community members working with your 
agencies. And Lauren, um, I might start with you if we can, because the first person who asked this question was asking about Jacob and I think Allison and wondering about how they got in, involved in this to begin with. You mentioned the events in their lives that maybe led them to it, but on a practical level, do, do cities reach out to youth uh, community members to get them engaged in these? Do, do the youth reach out to the city to say, like, I want to make a difference? Like, where does this start? And maybe, Lauren, if you want to, if you know the answers, and maybe we can continue through the panel there. Well, I know the comp, the answer. It varies. Uh, like New York City, there was one of the assistant commissioners who had been in it with education and new kids. And when they were trying to do speed reduction, she understood immediately that she needed a youth voice. At the same time that Allison was trying to figure out what her goals were to deal with wanting to be part of the solution. Uh, so sometimes it's it's just people connecting at the at the right time in the right place. And also there are someone else had asked about uh, how do you get Department of Public Works to care about you. There's all different places with it. I mean, there, there's the Vision Zero person, there's the Complete Street person, there's a Safe Routes to School person. Uh, we gave an award to the city of Milwaukee, Department of Public Works in tandem with uh, Miss Wisconsin Bikes because they work together to accomplish amazing things. Um, sometimes the youth ask, sometimes the like San Francisco, the Department of Transportation says we need a youth voice here. Uh, it can start anywhere. And we do talk a bit in this new guide about adults. Here's how you can start the conversation. Youth, here's how you can. I don't want to miss an opportunity to um, ask Renee and Melody the same questions, but mm -hmm. I, I also asked Sydney. Sydney, what how, how did you get involved? Like what made you want to get involved in something like this? Just curious. I, I think it would be an interesting uh, perspective to hear. Yeah, so um, like I mentioned earlier, I go to big, Nashville Big Picture High School, and so my school gives me an amazing opportunity to be able to internship in different places around Nashville. And so one of my um, big aspirations was to use like my designs to help other people. And so I'd already been a part of NYDT through um, another um, organization called the Oasis Center. And so a person from there mentioned, hey, um, there's a organization called NYDT. I think you might be great for it. And so that's how I um, got involved. So, that's yeah. great. And I've got one more question for you. I see you've got, you can't stay too much longer with us. I, I just wanted to ask if you had any advice for the audience. The audience, I don't know if we have any folks who are in high school, in middle school, who might be wanting to do this work, or probably more likely folks who may be wanting to work with people like yourself on projects, what advice would you have for them in kind of starting something like this up? Um, any any things that maybe you would like to see them do that that were, came from your experience? Yeah, I honestly, I think it's a great opportunity just to be able to even have the opportunity to do things like this at the uh, NYDT. But for people who like are like me, who are youth and are trying to do things like what I'm doing, sorry. Um, I kind of think that you should connect with somebody you know um, who is a part of the, I'm sorry. That's okay. Ooh. Okay, I'm sorry. Something happened with my internet. I'm sorry. Oh, Can you guys okay. hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So honestly, um, I kind of started off small and so it wasn't, um, it was kind of hard for me to be able to get to where I am today. So I think that it would be good if somebody could have an opportunity to go to a school like me, or if not, then just help others. Ooh. Oh, I know what that's like. Sorry, Sydney, you got a lot going on. I, I, I take I'm your point for so sure. Sorry. No, that's all right. I think um, we should have another opportunity to learn directly from folks like you who yeah. have gotten involved in this work because we we sometimes apply our own transportation lens to things. So it'd be it's refreshing always to hear somebody with your perspective. And um, if we can't keep you too much longer, that's okay. I just want to thank you for your yeah, time so for being here and doing this. I'm so sorry. Thank you, oh, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.
I wanted to circle back to Renee and Melody too on some of that that question before we wrap that up. Just that initial connection. I think a lot of people in the audience haven't done this before. They've done it maybe just a little bit. And I wonder how who's approaching whom? How should I reach out? How do I find the people who really want to get engaged in this stuff? I'll go quickly. Um, like I said, for Farrington, we we had a relationship with the engineering academy there and we wanted to strengthen that that's a new program here in our public high schools there's these academies that are set up um some are there's art academy actually that we did engage a bit there's business academy um really centered around kind of career prep and once we kind of broke into that group um uh all kinds of options opened up because they're always looking for real world opportunities um, for kids to kind of learn what, you know, is actually happening um, in their city. Um, so that was really easy for us. And then that leadership class um, was, I think Colby actually was the one that approached them. Uh, but once they kind of got on board with the topic, I mean, they fully embraced it. I mean, the beauty with transportation is that it affects every single person, everyone, right? And so this is not like some niche topic um, that, you know, people don't relate to. They may not think about it consciously, but once you kind of bring it up, they're like, oh yeah, I have such a hard time with this. Or um, So I think once we kind of brought it to the forefront, it just naturally flowed from there. Thank you. Yeah, so for um, middle schools, our program set out just, just from the beginning, it was um, supposed to be a curriculum like embedded within the school system. So the big idea was like every student that goes to at least public schools in Nashville will um, learn about how to design and plan their city. So that was a, uh, that was kind of what we were charged with, with the initial like um, mission and, and grants that we were given for that program. And so um, through that, we, ask the school system, like, what do you guys need or what would help curriculum wise from a partner? And that was project based learning. Um, they wanted their teachers involved. So we hired their teachers, wrote their curriculum and made something that was um, really marketable to teachers and then just kind of get in front of teachers every chance to let us in the door, really. Um, and so that's how we do it in middle schools. But also, like Renee said, like, um, Nashville also has schools that are always looking for career focused partnerships with people in the community, like people to provide, you know, field trips and guest speakers and the, you know, painting, um, art on the street. Like that's like a huge plus for them. But, um, but yeah, there's, I mean, you know, ours is called, I think like we have like alignment Nashville communities and schools. I'm not sure what other cities are called, but, um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of pathways through the school system to kind of get in there. Great. Thank you for that. Um, this one is sort of a, a, a mushing together of several questions. So let's see maybe what the top thing or the top of what things that, that you'd say in response to this. But, but people are wondering about what are sort of special considerations people need to keep in mind when planning to invite youth and engage youth in this kind of work. Um, people are mentioning things like legal parameters around parental consent, um, providing transportation if they don't have access to that, uh, best practices and reaching out to schools. The liability topic came up a few times just with respect to students being sort of in and around the roadway doing this work. Um, could, do, any, anything you ran into there or any recommendations you have for kind of working around some of those things? Yeah, um, so for our youth design team, we always get parent like we have a lot of permission forms that the parents sign at the beginning that covers a, a wide range of things, um, you know, like safety, media consent, things like that. Um, and we also keep the parents informed of, you know, of what it is. Like if we are getting out and painting in the street, like we let all of them know what that was. Um, and then we also hire traffic control for even for those shoulder bulb out artwork like traffic control was there um you know kind of either closing a lane or just creating a more of a buffer um uh, between the kids in the street and so that's an extra you know extra expense on our part but it's um it's required and and you know keeps everybody safer so hopefully that that covers yeah. things if there's another specific thing i didn't say then feel free to ask no that's okay uh renee any other considerations or maybe uh, this could be expanded things 
we encountered this and then realized, oh, this is something we should plan for in the future. I, I'm sure that happens on occasion. We do keep uh, a big box of yellow safety vests <laughs> around for projects, something to invest in, um, just kind of a simple thing um, as well. Um, and then we didn't go, we didn't drive anywhere. I mean, the whole point of our projects was to improve the area immediately around the school. Um, so we didn't, you know, we pretty much walked everywhere with the students and made logistics um, a lot easier. And it was honestly part of the learning experience. Um, so try to keep it local, I would, I would say. Yeah, good point. Um, this question came in specifically from Melody. Uh, Renee, I'm, I'm not sure if you addressed this or not, but um, the question was, as students work through these projects, it seems like the impression I got is that they, they get involved in every phase. Um, is there opportunity for a student based on their interest to focus really more on one part of the project, say the artistic design element, um, if, if that's really they're, where they're gravitating toward, or is the goal to maybe get them kind of equally involved along the way, you know, to see it from beginning to end? Yeah, so um, over the summer, we do a four week, what we call summer intensive, and they get experience in every, with everything, like they um, do a little bit of research and design and, um, and the advocacy and then towards the end of the summer inten intensive, we put them in committees to start doing uh, a little bit more focused projects. And with and then we'll have like a design committee and a advocacy, social media, like whatever is needed for the projects as a group they end up choosing to do. Then we we say okay, in order to carry out this new colorful bulb out on Dickerson Pike, and they also hosted some walk audits with the community. Um, what do we need? And then they form committees and throughout the school year, they use, utilize that committee structure to do most of their work instead of all of us like coming together in one spot. Yeah, we have both. Um, we had like that. So the engineering um, academy was kind of the core. But like I said, we did have some bigger, some of the workshops we invited like the art academy, um, the business academy, and some of those other folks um, kind of it more like at the input phases, um, just to broaden our kind of sample set and experience in the neighborhood and maybe get a few more female voices <laughs> um, into the project. Um, so I would think as much as you can is good, but if it's just a small portion, it's better than nothing. Um, you know, that was one of my big takeaways from our street plans folks was, you know, this is uh, you, you know, you can lecture about this as much as you want, but until the kids actually get out there and like touch it with their hands and feel it and do it for themselves, you know, those lessons that we're trying to teach them are not necessarily going to sink in. Um, so if you only have an opportunity for a small interaction, take it, right? It's, it's better than nothing. Uh, but if you do have the opportunity to do kind of a bigger life cycle project, um, obviously that's got a bit more meaning for those participants as well. Um, a few questions about what might be a, a sensitive topic when or an issue when you when you get into a project is these students may be super excited about a certain design. Uh, Renee, I think you touched on some of this a certain design, a certain configuration to only to find that maybe just based on the realities of the engineering of the street, it, it may not be possible. And I'm wondering, how do you kind of maintain that excitement and creativity and engagement without stifling it by saying, oh, well, that's not going to be possible. Um, we can't do that particular thing. Uh, any examples of how how to properly work through those conversations? Uh, yeah, so you guys probably remember we had lots of intersections with like big murals in the middle of them and everything. And um, we didn't we didn't really stifle it during the workshop. We just said, you know what, let them go. Let the creative juices go like, you know, they're the kids were a little reluctant at first to put pen to paper. And once we kind of sat there and kind of got them going and then they started, like we didn't want to do anything uh, to curtail that energy and that momentum. Um, and so, so we, you know, kind of did that, I don't know, after the fact, uh, but we tried to make it a little bit competitive too, right? So it was like, okay, whose team is going to win? And, and the kids got really excited about that, right? Because, um, there, there was a group that did the leaf and that was the one that we kind of thought was most feasible, most doable. So instead of, 
I don't know, kind of uh, criticizing some of the more ambitious ones. Uh, we really just tried to kind of elevate the one that we thought was most feasible. Um, and I didn't hear any uh, bad bad feelings or anything about having to select one. Um, yeah, <laughs> good question. Dan, you're muted. My apologies. Um, Melody, were there any examples of that kind of issue coming up in your projects, the push and pull versus what's realistic and what what they get excited about, what the kids might get excited about? Yeah, a couple things. Um, they do design things a lot that aren't realistic. and But similar to what Renee said, like we definitely want the creativity there. Um, but then also, you know, I, I feel like they've kind of accepted, oh, well, maybe I can't do exactly what I wanted to do, but at least we can get out and build it. You know, it, it's like the purpose is, um, like the purpose is that advocacy for long-term change with their tactical ur urbanism. Um, and so I think as long as that purpose is still there for them, they've seemed to be okay with it. And um, I mean, that crawl or the Dickerson Pike bulb out started as like a glow in the dark crosswalk in the middle of the street, which you know, lo and behold, we can't find glow in the dark paint anywhere. And um, and when TDOT saw the design, they were like, so many things need to change about this to be approved. MUTCD, like approved colors, all that stuff. Um, but I think, you know, they were, they just met in the middle and it was a really good learning real world experience. Um, and so, yeah, and then with the schools, we just have more designs from the kids than we can possibly do. And so we just tell them, hey, like everyone's doing something, but they're all contributing to one design, you know, and they vote on their favorites that kind of give us a direction for that. Um, so, yeah, I think just kind of setting expectations beforehand and keeping the purpose there is that's what we try to do. That's great. Lauren, I wanted to come to you. Um, the, we did share the links to some of the resources that you all just put out. And I really enjoy like the way they are framed. It's all framed as, as building a partnership between youth and, and the adults involved in the projects. And I think based on some of the comments coming in, a lot of the prior examples of youth engagement have really been about, we're going to tell you children how to be safe on the road, and then maybe we can do some transportation stuff. But a lot of it is the education, the message sharing. And this just seems totally different in the way it's laid out. Obviously, these examples are, but in the guidance especially. And I wonder if you could just speak a bit more about having these set up as true partnerships between youth and the adults working on the projects and not necessarily uh, um, we're going to oversee your work and, and tell you exactly what to do. That is one of the things that youth told us is that, yeah, we're seen as tell other youth to wear their seat belts and not drink and drive and don't text. Uh, and they actually were much more ambitious uh, about, they wanted to be part of the larger solution. Uh, and some of them uh, wanted to, uh, one school the, in Atlanta, the students had gone out and found a site that they thought needed to have a quick build project. So they went to go talk to the Atlanta Public Works. It turns out they had already identified the same site that the students had and come up with the same plan that the student had. And so immediately it was quite understood that youth have a lot more value than, I mean, it's very important to be talking to your peers, but they, they're looking at careers. Uh, they're looking at, at building their resumes. They want to uh, meet with, be treated as equals. And, and a lot of places now get that and they're giving them that and the rewards to both are great. But, you know, in our comments, we'll, you know, we'll talk about, okay, youth, here's what you need to do. Don't ghost a, a person. We had one person say, well, I invited this youth to talk to a congressman in our area and they didn't show up. Well, that meant that another youth might not get an opportunity. On the other hand, youth have showed up for things and been treated like they have no voice and don't know what they're talking about. So while there's been a lot of advancement and a lot of people now are really engaged and understand the value of the relationship, there is, there is a need uh, for both sides to think about what, uh, what are my expectations when I'm coming and what do I need to respect about the, per the other person. And when it's done as equals, uh, great things seem to be happening. Um, 
Yeah, that's great. I don't know if that addresses what you wanted, but that's that's what I heard passionately when we were talking to all these groups. I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if Renee or Melody, you have any follow-ups to that or other comments? Yeah. I would just say you don't work with youth often. Um, I'm sure Melody works with youth constantly, but if you don't work with them often, like most people in the city, you you think that they're kids and they have nothing to contribute. And then when you get there and you talk to them, I mean, as early as, you know, kind of late elementary school, middle school, they understand these concepts just as well as their parents and people who come to public meetings. It's, um, they're very sharp and they have tons to contribute. So I think that perception may come from people who don't do this work frequently, but hopefully you'll be pleasantly surprised once you start. I know I, I have been myself. Thank you. Um, so I'll shift gears a little bit. Um, Melody, we can come back to that one if you want to weigh in as well. But but there were there's so many questions about materials. And uh, I'm sure you all both have offered some really good advice on materials, you know, differences. And Renee, your comments about the inverse relationship between how easy it is to use versus how long it might last. I think that was really useful for a lot of people. Um, we don't want to go in depth on materials, but I wonder, maybe Melody, I'll, I'll start with you if you don't mind. The, any Any experience you've had, positive or negative, or like things to keep in mind when purchasing materials or choosing between options, things you really like or maybe would avoid, um, any feedback like that would be really appreciated, I'm sure. Yeah, we, so for the school, pro, the paint challenge school project um, that, I mean, it stays for, we've seen them stay anywhere from like pretty well in pretty good shape for one to two years. Um, we use traffic paint for that. Um, and then we try to keep an ongoing partnership with the school. So we're refreshing every other year is that we, we recently, we, this project hasn't been going on very long, but that's um, the cycle we're hoping to get into. And then um, for, but we usually just take like cornstarch and mix it with food coloring for the projects that are supposed to be short term, like the Dickerson mm -hmm. Pike one. That was only meant to be up for a weekend. And we, you know, organized advocacy events, put out a press release, um, and so it was meant to be like an advocacy weekend, and that was kind of the visual focal point of it. Um, and so, you know, next time it rained, it washed away, but no clothes got stained, and it it served the purpose for the weekend. So, yeah, corn starch and water is is our short term material, <laughs> and it's cheap. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned two things: marine paint, which I think you can buy at any paint store, um, and I think it comes in a maybe more colors, I don't know, than traffic paint. But we had a pretty decent experience with that. It was like, it was similar to house paint. It was a little thicker. Um, it's pretty hot here. So it might be th even thicker <laughs> if you have cold weather, uh, but found that um, workable. Like I said, cars though, driving over it frequently, it's, it's not going to last. Um, and then the second, Stevenson, we use tennis court paint, which was very dry. Um, I've never used it before. I honestly don't know exactly where you buy it, um, but it's a little bit darker and it goes on. Um, it, it, it almost like pills when it dries and you can kind of like brush it off. It's very unique. Um, it's not the most vibrant um, palette, but I thought it was pretty good and you didn't have to add anti-skid to it, right? Because it's like super matte. Um, we not... Thank goodness, not from uh, one of our youth projects, but we did have a private property owner paint uh, their sidewalks with some murals. And we have had a slip claim uh, because they didn't use anti-skid materials. Um, so those are the two products that we used on these projects. Um, but like I said, you it, it's okay to use a less durable material if you can protect it and put up um, some delineators. It, it will last quite a long time um, as long as nobody's uh, running tires over it generally. Thank you for that. Uh, a, a related topic, one that came up a, a few times, more than a few times, uh, in fact, is the question about maintenance of the projects once they're completed and whether that is uh, something that the students get involved with as well um, over time or if that how does that, how is that handled? I guess if you want the project to have some staying power, is that the the city, um, the local transportation agency that's that's doing that work? I guess it's similar in line to what you were talking about. We're getting into with the evaluation of uh, projects. Is that timeline may exceed the period where the students are there? Um, just curious about the weather maintenance is wrapped into all this. 
So, so we did the Kalihi project as a pilot. The city wasn't necessarily interested in running these projects, but we figured let's go do it ourselves so that we know how to do it and we can write the guidelines so we can help community groups try to do it. So that's our ideal is to have these be more community sponsored so that when the maintenance needs comes up, we can ask our community groups to do them. <laughs> um, but Farrington High School, knowing that we did the project, the maintenance is on us. Um, the the paint maintenance has been pretty minor, to be honest. Um, so we haven't needed droves of volunteers again. The biggest maintenance for us has been delineators, trying to keep them vertical, uh, replacing them. We do have a bus stop right next to uh, the curb extension. So one of them, at least one of them constantly gets run over by buses. And that is more of a city maintenance function or something that we use kind of specialized volunteers for. Um, that said, um, Papipi in Eva Beach, they did a beautiful uh, project that I did not share today. Blue Zones did that one. And they were so successful in generating community volunteers that they do um, service days uh, with a lot of their original volunteers. Um, and some of those include kind of alumni associations as well. So that's another way to keep you know the school kind of involved even if the specific students um, are, are not there anymore. Melody, anything on the um, maintenance topic that you wanted to share, um, how that's handled? I guess it, it, it sounds like it's not necessarily part of the youth focused initiative it, or unless it is, sorry. Yeah, I think um, the the youth design teams, they're all meant to be some kind of temporary, they're meant to be a like kind of a visual focal point of some greater, larger like advocacy effort. So they're not really meant to be maintained long term. Um, they're more meant to, you know, advocate for more permanent infrastructure that's not necessarily our our wheelhouse because we're not, you know, we're not a we're a nonprofit, we're not a government agency that that does like builds permanent complete streets, but we, you know, we just try to advocate for those. Um, so yeah. Remove, Melody, do you remove them or do they just fade away? Um, it depends. The The Dickerson Pike one just faded away. Um, I think we went out and removed, like we saw the, the po flex posts were, they were starting to get in ditches and stuff. And so we you know, we went and removed those. Um, but yeah, the the paint just washed away. We didn't have to remove that. Um, and the other another one they did was a soccer field. And you know, once like the grass grew and got cut, that was gone. And then we left goals there that we had purchased. And um, they stayed for a while. I saw them at least a few months afterwards um, before someone took them away. But yeah. Well, Lauren, yeah. I wanted to ask you a question that I'll that I'll. Uh, ask Renee and Melody soon is that is whether I, I guess in in preparing some of the guidance around this and the work that you've done, how often are these types of projects acting as sort of a maybe a catalyst for the city to do more quick build projects in general, um, or whether the maybe these are places that are already doing a lot of quick build and then engaging youth is like another facet of that, um, or is maybe the engaging youth in quick build maybe a way for the city to see hey this is actually working pretty well maybe we could do these these types of projects in more places? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, the The illustration I gave from what, from Bike to School Day, where they were going to do a temporary bike path, and that was the impetus, the, re, the public support, the youth support, to get the city to go ahead and produce this guide and start doing lots more. Most every place I've seen where something has been tried, whether it's a pop-up, or a quick build, which is more permanent, it has led to more. Uh, lots of places don't want to be the first to do something. Uh, and so all the different places that are doing something are inspiring others to. But once you get the first one in and the feedback is good and the youth are, or, or a part of it, it almost invariably leads to more and better. Um, and the relationship, when it's a respectful one, both ways, um, I think cities are just thrilled with having the youth involved. And I guess the same question, similar question maybe for Renee and, and Melody, have this, were the cities already doing 
these types of projects a lot or are these maybe giving the cities maybe inspiration to do more kind of curious how that how it maybe fit into the bigger picture um so our the design center had a pretty long uh, we called it turbo it was a tactical urbanism project that's been around or program that's been around for a, a while that does temporary quick build pop-up installations meant for advocacy and we um over I don't know how many years developed a relationship with our public works department where we had a um, a permit system going with them where um, we developed the permit system with them and so you know we pretty easily could do that kind of stuff and then we also partnered on them with things like we were kind of the the testing ground for ideas or if a community was apprehensive to like a bike lane or something like we would be the ones that would contract to get out there and temporarily install one um, and so it's similar now um, they have really revamped their permit um, so we're getting used to that but it's yeah similar and then with TDOT before Sydney's group you know advocated for that design um, they had never approved tactical urbanism on a state route before um, and after they you know when when the youth asked them they were like oh yeah sure we'll we'll do it for you but not for the adults and yep. um and then when it went well that was around when the nashville's uh, vision zero report was coming out and tdot actually put that in there as a recommendation to do tactical urbanism on state routes um so we were like okay we think they like that and now they're they're open to it and similar with our local transportation department we're as the nonprofit, um, just seen as like kind of a tactical urbanism expert that comes in and, you know, get does the community engagement and kind of testing ground for for things that they might want to install more permanently. That's great. Renee? Um, so this was, I thought it was our first mural, uh, street mural project, the Farrington one in Kalihi, uh, but it actually wasn't. There was one before this and we had um, we had installed kind of a quick build curb extensions with uh, asphalt curbing protecting um, the space. And I have to really give credit to Blue Zones Project. They um, were very active here at the time. And they went in uh, with some students and they painted murals within the space, right? It was kind of separate from the project. And I think that sort of sparked um, this now series of projects that uh, we've done both on Oahu and then some of our neighbor island uh, counties came over and actually helped us with some of the early projects so they could learn and go do them on their own islands. Um, so it was uh, kind of setting a, a good process for the projects. Um, it also set out, um, identified the process for other things like the bus shelters. We also paint um, similar to what Sydney presented. Um, and then our traffic control boxes, communities can come through and paint those. And so once we did this, it kind of set out like the approval process um, because when Blue Zones did that first one, there was no process. And we we're like, I don't know, go here, go there. Um, so it really did help to kind of solidify what that is enough that we now have guidelines. But I will say it also, opened up quick build within the city. So we do quick build all the time. There's no art, it's not necessarily beautiful, <laughs> um, but we've realized that you can have pretty significant safety benefits with these quick build projects. And if you have the youth engaged in the art and the placemaking, it's like just amazing. But even without that, there's a strategy um, to be learned by the city. So there's just uh, a, lot of, a lot of payback, a lot of reward uh, that we continue to see uh, from going through this process. Um, with all our partners. So one more clarifying question that came in a couple of times is your is the funding that you get to support these projects. I think I remember hearing that um, for Department of Health funding uh, for a lot of them. Were there other major funding sources that you'd encourage people, I guess, to look for to say, you know, this, this is where you might find some support for doing things like this? So our first one uh, had a lot of money from Department of Health, and I think that's pretty unique. <laughs> I think it was kind of a pilot, and it was uh, particularly flush time for um, the state. Uh, they used to get um, some tobacco settlement money that's not not there anymore. Um, so the projects now you see are really cobbling uh, funding sources together. Um, and so uh, at the city for Complete Streets Office, I will always provide delineator materials. Um, you know, that's like three, four, five thousand dollars worth of materials that we'll donate. Um, installation 
probably got to fundraise for that. And um, locally, it came uh, from the city as well as from some private philanthropy. Um, and there's other little mini grants around town. I know people have applied for like for parklets and stuff too. So, so we're sort of seeing people bootstrapping a bit um, and really just different partners uh, bringing different uh, resources to the table. Melody, on the funding side, any other tips or common sources? Yeah, um, well, I, I feel like nonprofit fundraising is probably different, but um, but the Dickerson Pike project was actually Tennessee Department of Health funded. Um, they have a healthy built environment grant. And so that was, we were a part of that grant. We weren't the only one, but we were like kind of with a group of people that were um, working on that and all on different projects along Dickerson Pike. Um, but yeah, we um, have a combination of grants or sponsorship from local corporations. Um, we also had a pretty big National Institute of Justice grant um, that funded the youth design team because the data that they collect contributes to or contributed to a data set that was um, looking at youth safety and violence prevention in neighborhoods. And so we kind of cross over into not just transportation and built environment, but also in um, in the research and neighborhood safety really space. So um, that was another big one of ours. So yeah, it's a, it's a combination of government and private and sponsorships and grants. Okay. Well, thank you so much um, for that and for answering all these questions. We are just out of time at the clock. Uh, we've used the full the full period. So we'll let everyone go on to your next meetings. But I just want to say thank you again uh, to our entire panel and, and to Sydney as well. Uh, she had to uh, take off a little bit early. Um, we really enjoyed hearing your stories. Um, Lauren, thank you for sharing the new guidance with us. Uh, we hope we'll take that. Everyone can take that and kind of use it for insp inspiration for your own projects. Um, as you leave today, you'll be greeted with a brief set of questions. We'd appreciate your feedback to us if you, if you have a moment to provide that. And you'll be um, given instructions then to uh, generate your certificate of attendance for the webinar. Be on the lookout for a follow-up email from me with um, webinar feedback information, um, the archive materials, the recording, all of that will be coming to you separately. But thank you again to our panel. Thanks to you all. And we hope to see you next time. Bye, everybody.